I'm the underdog with the heroic card. I'm Aaron Jones Jr. I have to keep pushing for my kids. If I give up, what's that leave them with? Nothing. I have to understand that it's bigger than me. That it's not about me when I wake up and go to work. It's not about me when I'm reading and educate myself. It's not about me when I'm practicing my speeches. It's not about me. It's about my family. Hey, 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 you're now tuned in to Underdog Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Jones Jr., the underdog with the heroic heart, and I have conversations with successful underdogs, and today we have Miss Leticia. How are you doing today? I'm doing amazing. Thank you. Thank That's you for good. having me here. Oh, no problem. Thank you for um, spending your time with me and my audience today. Um, you're located in England, so we're on a different time frame. So, um, thank you for, you know, being able to work out your, you know, your schedule because it's the evening time there, afternoon here. So mm-hmm. appreciate you again. Um, no before worries. we get started, go ahead. Go ahead. What'd you say? I said, no worries. <laughs> All right. Before we get into our conversation, today's episode is sponsored by Christian DeWan, Positive Energy Through Your Clothes. We have hoodies, we have t-shirts, we have sweatshirts for the babies, for the toddlers, for the youth, for moms, dads, grandmas, aunties, uncles, you know, grandfathers, anybody. We got uh, something for everybody. You can go to ChristianDewan.com, and if you use the promo code Underdog Talk Podcast, you'll get 15% off. So let's get right on into today's conversation. So... You're a coach. You have your own coaching um, platform. You have a podcast, Mm -hmm. all those things. But before, you know, before you got to understanding life a little more, where were you at and what was going on in life at the time? Well, I grew up in Bermuda. Um, I was born and raised there. And at the age of 14, I got into a relationship with somebody that was twice my age. Uh, the relationship was abusive uh, for the, its duration. I ended up marrying him and my divorce came as a result of him stabbing me. So let me just explain a bit. I grew up in between two family units. Both of my parents married and both of their spouses didn't want anything to do with me. So it was quite easy for me to get caught up in attention from man, um, which is what happened. You know, I'm not getting attention at him. Here this guy comes along. He wines and dines me, essentially. And it was an escape from what was going on in my household. The first time he put his hands on me, I was only 16. And I knew that that's not what a relationship should look like. So I left. I packed up my stuff and I left. But because of what was going on in my household, um, when I was 17, I was kicked out. And I had nowhere to go because, you know, when you get in fights with your parents, you can't then go to to your family. Um, (laughs) So I called this guy because he had his own house can I come live with you? And he said, yes. That was the one of the worst decisions I've ever made in my life. But it was a decision that I had to make out of necessity. I needed a roof over my head. And he reminded me on a daily basis that he was the only person that was there for me when I really needed it. The psychological abuse that I endured for years because of that allowed me to stay. (laughs) And I I always say that because a lot of people, if they have not been in an abusive relationship, always question, well, why would you stay? Like, why would you put up with that? Physical abuse, nine times out of 10, comes after long psychological abuse. So by the time, you know, I'm getting beaten on a regular basis, I actually believe that I deserved it. I believe that I was worthless. I believe that, you know, I owed this man my life. What was interesting was during that period of time, I was working in law enforcement. And because I was working in law enforcement, I actually could see how nasty 
the police were. Um, working alongside the police, seeing them talk about people, um, laugh about people's situations. I never wanted anyone to know what was going on be behind closed doors for me. So I hid it and I hid it for years. Um, in my early 20s, I had made a decision that I wanted to go to university. And I remember talking to my husband about it and he had told me no. If that's what I wanted to do, I should have done it before I got married. And that was the first time I remember feeling like I was trapped in that relationship. Because I'm a person, I am, I love being educated. I love learning. So for me, actually seeing that this guy that supposedly loves me is holding me back, I started getting resentful. And I remember one night, one of my friends had called me. This was after like a long shift. I used to work at the airport and I couldn't find my cell phone. So she had called me on my landline and was telling me about this relationship that she was in. She was in an abusive relationship with a heroin addict. And I like literally read her her rights. Like, why are you there? Why are you putting up with this? Like, you deserve so much better. But I felt like a hypocrite because no one knew what I was dealing with. That night, my husband came home and he was drunk and very angry because he had found my cell phone, which contained text messages to another man. And after years of abuse and torture, I knew that whatever was about to happen was going to be real bad. So I remember running to the landline and calling my mama and like, listen, you have to come get me right now. Please come get me. And he pulled the landline out of the wall and told me <laughs> that the only way that I was leaving that night was in a body bag. And that night my husband stabbed me. I fought for my life, essentially. And my mom listened. She had come to the house after our big fight. And she, when she came and saw that I was bleeding, she wanted to take me to the hospital. And I was like, no, no, <laughs> I'm not going to the hospital. Because I knew if I went to the hospital, the police would be called. And I didn't want my co-workers to know what was going on in my life. So... I ended up at a homeless shelter that night because my mother told me that I couldn't come and stay with her. Um, and I stayed in a homeless shelter for two months until I got on my feet. I was able to get a restraining order against my husband and I filed for divorce. And you would think life would just like magically get better. Nah, it didn't. <laughs> it got worse. Um, <laughs> I think I was naive. I was so young. I was like 21 at this point. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm left this toxic relationship and okay, everything's just going to fall into place. But the problem was I didn't know who I was. Everything about my life was tied to my interpersonal relationship. So even if I had described myself self to someone, I would say, oh, I'm so-and-so's daughter or I'm so-and-so's wife. Like I didn't know who Letitia was. And that was a problem for me. I was alone for the first time in my life, having to sit with all of the stuff that was going on in my head. And the only way that I knew to deal with that was to drink. And I drank and I drank <laughs> and I drank some more. And I'm not talking about wine coolers and like night train. <laughs> like I was drinking bottles of scotch. At, at one point in time, I remember going to a bar being it was me and my friend there and I was the only one drinking scotch and in a four hour period I drank the entire bottle and then started another bottle and the problem with that was I hate being I hated being drunk and I actually didn't like the taste of scotch right so mm -hmm. like after years of drinking and like trying to drown things out I decided look I don't I like I need a change and I made a decision to move to Atlanta and I went to Georgia State University. So I really focused on my my education. I got 
scholarships. Like I was making more money <laughs> as a student than I was working for the government of Bermuda. So those four years in Atlanta was like life. I, I had a great time. I was doing really well in school. I had a 4.0 at, um, GPA. Like I was doing well. And then I meet this guy. <laughs> and I'm going to be honest with you, coming from a very small island, I was terrified to date in the States. Because in Bermuda, if I meet somebody, I can call my friend and I can have his entire life history in five minutes. I would know who he's related to, who he's slept with, everything. I don't have access to that kind of information meeting somebody in the States. And like, I was like, I can't date because I'm going to end up dating somebody who's married. Like, that was my impression. <laughs> Right. So I meet this guy who's a DJ. He like works at night. He sleeps all day. He mentions to me that he does cocaine when he's working. And I was naive. I didn't understand addiction at that point in time. I ended up moving in with this guy. And I said to you earlier, I was making more money as a student than I was working. This guy drained me of everything because his little cocaine use while he was working was a full-blown coke problem and I didn't understand so he manipulated me heavily and literally took everything that I had I was with him for three years and I went back home one summer to work because I was starting to run out of money and I decided to pop up <laughs> I was paying for the apartment that we were living in and it was my birthday and I popped up to this apartment and met my boyfriend of three years wife oh. he was married the whole time <laughs> and I had no idea that was devastating for me because I had spent almost 10 years in an abusive relationship to then get into a, a toxic relationship, my first relationship out, out of that, and literally be used for years to be slapped in the face that this man has a wife. So I moved back to Bermuda. Things were going really well for me. I got a job in commercial insurance. I was really focused on my job. And I started getting lonely. And I remember having a conversation with one of my friends saying, I just need a man. But like, I, I'm going to be picky this time. <laughs> so we sat down and like wrote, wrote out a list of 45 things that my next man needed to have. Like, if he didn't tick those boxes, it would be a problem. A couple of weeks later, I meet this guy. And like, as I'm talking to him and as I'm getting to know him, like he's just ticking all the boxes, except his height. Like I'm 5'10". So I wanted someone that was like 6'8", you know, he was <laughs> not that. He was not that, but everything else. And I fell really hard with this guy. Within six weeks, we were living together, like... It was the first time in my life I was in a relationship where I felt who I felt um, I felt accepted for who I was. Like it was magical, the fresher. And then one of his family members died, and my boyfriend then relapsed on crack. And I remember giving him an ultimatum, like, listen, <laughs> I just went through three years of this. I'm not doing it again. So like, get yourself together or I'm, I'm out. And even though I had dealt with an addict for three years, I was still really naive. Like you do not give an addict an ultimatum. They are either going to manipulate you more <laughs> or hide what they're doing more. And that's exactly what happened. He hid what was going on much better. And I was caught up in a web that I actually didn't know that I was in. 
I remember him calling me one day and he was a chef. He worked at a very prestigious um, supermarket and he also used to cater on the side. So he always used to call me and say, listen, I need you to come pick up this meat. I'm going to do this catering gig on the weekend. Cool. So this day he calls me, asks me to come pick up some meat. So I go to his job and I pick up the meat. And as soon as I am leaving, I'm surrounded by security. Apparently he had been stealing the meat from his job and using me <laughs> to get it out. And they finally caught him on camera. So I'm like, here you go. <laughs> I don't have nothing to do with this. I don't break the law. <laughs> Like, that's not my life. Like, I don't do that. So I handed over the bag and I thought nothing else of it. He was arrested. He lost his job. He was charged with stealing. But two weeks later, I'm at work and the receptionist calls me and she was like, Leticia, the police are here <laughs> and they want to see you. So I'm like, why the hell would the police be here? So I go to reception and I'm arrested um, on my job for receiving stolen property. So I go to jail. I'm actually in jail longer than him. I was in jail for eight hours and I had to call my mama. So I was like, listen, I need you to get me a lawyer. You know, I remember sitting in the jail cell for a little while and the sergeant came to get me and he was like really agitated, like, who are you? Like, and I'm like, I don't even know where I'm going. Like, why are you asking me all these questions? So I get to this room and my mama's there. She had pulled some strings and wanted to have a conversation with me. <laughs> so like, that's the worst thing, in my opinion, having to explain why I'm being arrested after I was in law enforcement for almost 10 years. Um, but she sat there that day and she was crying and she asked me a very powerful question. She asked me, why do I love everyone else more than I love myself? Mm. And that was like a Mike Tyson body blow. You might as well just take my breath away. But I think that was when I realized for the first time that my actions, even though I was not responsible for being in jail that day, my actions were the reason why I was there. My decisions were the reason why I was there. And if I don't change the way that I'm showing up and the way that I'm doing things, like this is going to be my life. And that was a hard realization, if I'm honest. But when I was finally released from jail, I was not charged with anything. Um, I called a life coach and I worked with a life coach for five months. Working with that life coach helped me realize that I had been living in victimhood for most of my life. You know, I had a bad relationship with my parents. I was in an abusive relationship. I then was in a relationship with an addict who was married. And then my addict boyfriend got me locked up. But I had gotten so used to that narrative because it kind of made me feel like somebody needed to have sympathy for me. And working with the coach made me realize that I was actually given my, my power away by doing so. By being a victim, I was resigning myself to the fact that I could not change my circumstances. So I worked very hard on changing that mindset. I've moved from being a victim to a driver. And as a result of that coaching relationship, I moved to England to start over. And that is what I did. I came out here. I focused on my career. And before I started my business, I was working in Lloyd's of London, the oldest insurance institution in the world, as a manager of a multinational team. And I was really proud of myself because I had picked myself up from all of this stuff that had happened in my life and actually turned it around so it actually meant something. But the problem was me. I had reached the pinnacle of my career as a foreign Black woman in England. I wasn't getting any higher. That's the reality. I was treated like trash. <laughs> 
I, I say, you know, I was a manager, but I was never allowed to make decisions. I had white men constantly undermining me and disrespecting me. being in a meeting one day and being called a little girl. And there is no amount of professionalism that I could have put on that day that would have allowed that disrespect to continue. So I remember getting off that call and saying to my husband, I'm so happy I'm not in the office because if I was, I would have been arrested today. <laughs> and I made the decision to walk away. I am not going to allow someone to undermine and undervalue and underpay me as well as disrespect me after everything that I've been through in my life. So I chose me and I've spent the last year and a half building my business. I am extremely passionate about black women stepping into their own power through entrepreneurship. So that is what I focus on. My business is, has been formed around helping other black women walk away from toxic work environments and stepping into their own power by choosing them, choosing their strengths and, and really allowing that to uh, make them shine. So all of that to say, that's how I ended up here now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was a powerful story, though. Um, I was taking notes as you were talking, and it's a lot of different things people can take away from um, what you said. Um, what I got, though, was at the beginning, you know, when you were going through the abuse and everything and the relationship with your family, you felt you had to escape, but you were in a bad environment no matter where you had went. <clears throat> and sometimes people are in those environments and they don't understand how to get out of those environments. And it's just crazy. Like your your love story, like uh <laughs> you just had bad luck with <laughs> you just had <laughs> you just had bad luck with me. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that. Like I know, did. I can I can earn yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, you had, I don't know what what at that time in your life attracted bad men, but it, it attracted them. Um, but one thing, though, your mom was always around, even though at the beginning you said, you know, you guys had your issues. But as, a, as every problem that you had, you know, your mom was there. And sometimes, you know, we go through life and our parents, you know, um, our relationship with our parents can be rough. but a mom's always going to be there. Dad's always going to be there, but it just depends on the relationship. But a mom's always going to be there for you, uh, no matter what you what you do. And then um, it was funny. You said you had a, a, 40, a, 45, a 45, uh, list, 45 thing list that a man had to have. And that was hilarious because it was hilarious because it was like 45 different things because – for men, our list is a lot shorter than a woman. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> but I under but I understand like you made sure like, hey, this is what I want. This is you know, you had non negotiables. People don't understand before you get in a relationship, you need to have those non negotiables. But I think the most powerful thing was um when your mom said, Why do you love everybody but yourself? Yeah. And I want listeners to like, let's pause and really ask yourself, if you're that kind of person, why do you love everybody but yourself? Because if you don't love yourself, you can't love anybody else in the proper way. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you can't enjoy your own company, if you can't uh, do for you or you can't tell someone no, then you, you can't love anyone else. And I, in the last but the re I would say in the last like five years, I've learned that I have to love myself before I can love anybody else. But then what you also learned, though, you said, even though, you know, you made a, you, you were messing up by loving everybody else, you still made the decisions, you still made the choices that got you in the positions that you were in. Because you easily could have said, no, I'm good. I'm good, bro. Uh, I don't even want to be with you. OK. Oh, you. You're abusive. Oh, you hit me once. Um, oh, you hit me twice. I'm out of here. But you stayed, mm -hmm. so you understood. Like our decisions, either either we do it or we don't. It just depends on 
what the situation is. Sometimes you don't make a decision and it can be more expensive than if you made a decision. So it's all about that. But one thing though I love was you said you got a life coach. A lot of people don't even know what a life coach is, don't understand, and you got a life coach. And then you understood, you know, your issues, your problems. And then you said you got, okay, you got back on your feet, got you a little job, you was a manager, but but they was treating you like shit. And, yeah. and that happens. That doesn't happen just, you know, you said you're in England. That doesn't happen just over there. That happens everywhere when it comes to us black people. It's like we're the most powerful people on earth, I would say, because anything that we do, we're the best at it. And other people understand that and they don't want to see us in power because they feel like we'll do something wrong. But we actually have like the biggest heart because that's mm-hmm. what kind of people we are. Mm-hmm. Um, so... That was a lot, but I liked it though. I was listening to the story and and I want the listeners to listen, especially women, like as you go through the the beatings, you go through having a, a man that's older and doing different things, or you or man or female, you're in a relationship with someone and you know they have an issue, but they're hiding it and you and you you know, you're against their issue, but you still stay along because you love them, but you don't love yourself enough to say, hey, no, nah, I'm good. Mm-hmm. So, and I love that you said you're helping other black women because in our community over here, it's like women, I, I see women help women more than men help men. I don't know why mm-hmm. that is, but then you do have women that hate on other women. I don't understand that, um, but I love that. So when you started your coaching, um, how many people did you have? Was it a lot? Was it just one or two? Was it like a cousin, your mom? You know, who who was it? How did it go? Like when you first started on your own, doing your own coaching? When I first started, all of my clients were strangers. Um, I expected to be coaching my cousins and my friends, but the reality of entrepreneurship is you cannot depend on the people that are closest to you, strangers of what's going to make you rich. And I realized that early on, so that was my focus. Um, I've been fortunate enough in my business to have consistent clients. I've served women all over the world, Australia, Nepal, South Africa, Zimbabwe, all over the States, Canada, all over England. So I'm grateful to be able to be in that position, but it was about getting myself out there, getting visible, getting out of my own head (laughs) about what I had to bring to the table so that I can show up and serve the people that I wanted to serve. Mm. I love I, I love what you said. You said in entrepreneurship, you can't depend on people close to you. And I definitely understand that. You would think, oh, you know, you start a business, you start doing something, your people want to support you because you started it. No, they won't. And if you depend on that, you're gonna be you ain't gonna make no money. And you said strangers make you rich. It's yes. people it's people that you don't know that will give you the conf like give you not confidence but give you like affirmation that you're doing good or that you're a good person or whatever the case may be or they're gonna be the people that um buy what you what you have because there's people out there that think like you. Even though you have a group of friends, even though you were born in a family, you don't think like everybody else. Everybody don't think like you. So Mm -hmm. they're not gonna think like you. It's like if you got three friends, everybody dressed different. Me and my buddies went out last night, and I and I was paying attention. We all was fresh, but we all was fresh in our own way. Like mm-hmm. one guy had on a sweatsuit, another guy had a uh, hoodie and jeans. I had on a uh, hoodie and some different kind of pants, and it was like we all was fresh. But they wouldn't think to dress like me, and I could maybe dress like them. But everybody's different, so mm-hmm. there's other people in the world that think like you because. You are in England and I'm in Indianapolis and we kind of have you know, the same mindset. We're, we're going towards the same goal of serving and helping other people. And mm-hmm. we just met through a podcast group. So mm-hmm. we're strangers. And now that, that, that helps people even more. Like when you're strangers with people, you connect with people because your mindset is where their mindset is. You mm-hmm. might not have the same mindset in the environment that you're in as everybody else, but there's people out in the world that think like you and that's how you meet different people 
So you got this coaching. You got everything rolling. Um, how how is are you? You said you were married. Are you married? You're married, right? I am. I'm married to you, the guy that was on crack. He's been clean for nine years. We have two okay. beautiful children. That's that is wonderful. I wish I had the little machine with the little clap, you know, so you could see <laughs> the little clap. Um, so you got your coaching, you got your your babies, you you're married. How how is that? How are you balancing life um per, professionally and then at home? Well, to be honest, uh, my days are controlled by me now. Now that I don't have to answer to anyone signing into anyone's clock, my days suit my schedule. I homeschool my children. So my mornings are around homeschooling and family time. Afternoons is coaching time. Weekends, it's podcast time. And I just you know, I am a stickler for a schedule. <laughs> if you're not in my calendar, I don't have time for you in this moment, but that's what I do. And it, I, I manage to make it work. I actually have more time for myself, not working for myself, even though I'm working more hours because I, I, I make it work for me. I don't have to be signed in at nine o'clock to be on a call with somebody, you know, so it, it works. And this is what life should be, not what people pulling the strings tell us it should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I love what you said. Um, you got a lot of gems, a lot of quotables. I think, I don't know if quotables is the word, but you, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, you said your days are controlled by you. Yeah. And scheduling and calendar, I'm not so great at that. That's one thing I've been working on. That's why I got the calendar lead. So for the podcast, I know when I have a you know an interview with someone because like before I write it down or I'm like, oh yeah, you know, we're gonna do that and I forget. Or I'm like, oh crap, I gotta do this in, in 10 minutes, or dang, I'm not at home, or whatever the case may be. Now, you know, I know when I have someone to interview. Now I'm putting everything on my calendar. And you said if you're not in the calendar, you ain't got time for them. I love it. And people don't understand that, like, when you're, when you have a goal, when you have a purpose, when you're going after bettering yourself, you have to stick to that schedule. You have to, you know, I go to bed when I go to bed. I, it's not too many people that's going, I'm going to be on the phone with, I'm talking to or doing anything with at my bedtime because I know I need X amount of, you know, hours of sleep, even though I don't get a good, a great night sleep i know i need to go to sleep from x amount you know from this time to that time it's like no I, i'm not talking my phone goes on don't disturb and i love that you you know when you're doing your podcast you know when you're doing your coaching the morning times for the kids and and family and you homeschool and like that's awesome because i'm a, i'm an educator so i know how it is to um work with kids especially young kids and um it's not the easiest thing in the world so uh, kudos to you for doing that because Thank you. Our, our kids, our own kids are worse to us than they are with somebody else. And I know I'm sure that's got to come with a lot of challenges. Um, <laughs> yes. I wake up and miss every day like, what have I done? Because I'm not a morning person. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to get up and deal with these children. But the benefit for me is that they're not going to get held back by someone else's standards. And they're not going to be force-fed what someone else deems important um, in terms of that education. So I have a question. That's uh, um, with homeschooling. How do you allow your children to be social? How do they, you know, have friends outside of, you know, family members? How does that work with homeschooling? Um, the area that I live in has a huge homeschooling network. So socialize. The socialization is done through that. They do outings, group activities. So that is something that's very important. And we do a lot of outside activities as well. So, you know, my children were in sign language and um, different dance classes and such. So it keeps them active. And yeah, I think they're well-rounded children. <laughs> I love that's it. Awesome. I love it. I, you know, that's just a question that uh, that I, I just was thinking, like, okay, you know, kids are homeschooled, but how do they? And that's awesome that there's a network, and 
and there are uh, other people out there to that have you know that are homeschooling and you can get the kids together and stuff of that sort so that's mm-hmm. awesome because you know with kids um when they don't have siblings or sometimes like my son he he has a sibling but she's 16 so sometimes it's not where they're you know they're hanging out so he don't really have anyone his age to play with so when he comes over to my house I try to make sure I'm calling my buddies. We're doing something with kids or we're doing something outdoors um, as much as possible because I understand with kids, you know, they got to, you know, got to have somebody to talk to because, listen, I, uh, I'm a I'm a preschool teacher and the things that I hear the little kids say, I'd be like, oh, wow, really? Like, they, it, it's just, it amazes me, their conversation and the stuff that they talk about. I wish I could have recorded myself as a, as a young kid to hear what I used to talk about because I'm sure it was some crazy stuff. So, do you, um, with your coaching, do you only work with people face to face? Is it virtual? Um, so are you working, you know, are you all over the world or is it just um, in your area? All virtual. So yeah, I've served people all over the world. And I think that's the beauty of social media and the beauty of technology. You don't have to be conformed to a single location. Yes, yes, definitely. I, and I, I love uh, that I'm able to do the podcast virtually because I tell my son, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm going here, I'm here, I'm there. He's like, how are you doing places? I'm like, because I'm interviewing people, you know, virtually and so today I'm in England, you know, mm-hmm. yesterday I was in Ohio, uh, last week I was in Brooklyn. It's just, it's cool to meet people all over the world and see different cultures and just, you know, understand uh, different things from different people because obviously people think like us and they just don't always live in our area. So mm-hmm. um, you have a podcast. What is your pod? what's the name of your podcast for the listeners and what is your podcast about? My podcast is named Choosing Her Hustle, and it's about the transition and the barriers that Black women face while moving from side hustler to full-time entrepreneur. So each week, I share stories of women who have successfully transitioned. They're telling the stories of the issues that they had in corporate America or corporate wherever they are. And the lessons they've learned as they've built the business in hopes that my listeners will too choose their hustle. Mm, I love it. I love, I, I love it. Choose your, choose her hustle. I love it. Um, so you, uh, you have your coaching. So mm-hmm. how, so I, I did a little research. I did a, you know, on your, um, and you don't have to go all into it, but I like how these two things, I wrote them down. Vibe, and then it says embrace too much, too muchness. I think, yeah, embrace too yes. muchness. So can you speak a little on what vibe is and then what what does that mean, embrace your too muchness? What does that mean? Let's start with the too muchness. Okay. I, my entire life, have been told that I'm too much. I'm too loud. I'm too opinionated. I've got too much attitude. I talk too much with my hands, right? But mm-hmm. when I started my business, those elements of me that have made un- people uncomfortable my entire life is what my clients gravitate towards. They love the fact that I have too much opinions because I show up online and I say what I feel, which allows them to move forward. I have too much attitude, which means I don't back down from the BS. I serve powerhouses, powerhouses, powerful, powerful black women. So they need someone who can stand up to them so that they can change their narrative and get out of the way. So when I say embrace your too muchness, your too muchness is exactly what you need in order to change this world. Mm. I, before you get into vibe, I, I, I love it because I feel the same way People be like, oh, you too loud. Did you really just say that? Yes, I did. Why Why wouldn't I say that? Like, I uh, I wrote down what makes some people uncomfortable is what makes you great. Because yes. everybody can't, everybody don't know how to accept your greatness, but you have to live in your greatness. And you can be too loud. You can be too much for some people, but you're going to be just enough 
for the right people. And when you understand that, and that's when you be your authentic self. Yes. That's when you're you. And uh, when I first started my podcast, it, I, was, I had just started you know, doing motivational speaking. So it was all motivation. And it was like, this isn't me. And I was like, I got I to gotta be me. I, I, you know, I, I cuss a little bit. I don't say everything politically correct. You know, I got a little ratchetness to me. I'm, I'm educated, but it's like, I got to do all those things because people like that. I'm funny. And it's like, once I start doing that, that's when I got listeners. That's when people are like, oh, okay, I want to be on your podcast. Or uh, other people wanted me on theirs. And it was when I embraced my too muchness. And mm-hmm. I, I listen, embrace your too muchness. Because just because you're too much for some people don't mean you're not too much for everybody. Because Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure Jesus, you know, made it's some people uncomfortable. Yes. Yeah, he was a little too much for some people, but he was just enough for the right people. So we we, we ain't going to go to church or nothing on that note. But uh, <laughs> explain Vibe. So Vibe is the proprietary system that I use with my clients. I told you that I focus on helping women build businesses. So Vibe is the four steps that I use to help them do that. V stands for vision, getting a really solid clear vision of where you want to be, where you want to take your business. And then that allows you to take intentional steps to move forward. I is identify, identify what your secret source is, what you do well, which will allow you to make money like no one else. That is your competitive advantage, but also identify who your ideal client is and what problem you're solving for them. B is for build, building and engage Um, personal brand, which allows you to build your audience and build your tribe. So you are in front of the people whose problem you are solving. And E is embody. It's about embodying a success mindset, showing up as you need to today, as if you had the success that you desire for tomorrow. And those four steps help my clients get consistent clients into their business and allow them to move away from their soul sucking careers. Mm. Mm. We're going to we just, we, yeah, you, <laughs> you just dropped it, drop, drop some, drop some on the listeners. And I think this, this episode is going to help a lot of women out um, because of the story you gave uh, a backstory. And some women, they didn't deal with everything that you dealt with, but they dealt with some things that you, you went through and you've shown that throughout bad relationships with men without um, through bad relationships with your family going through bad relationships you know when you finally got to that point of oh my job you know I'm, I'm this person I got this title but you still were treated badly until you finally realized hey let me do me mm-hmm. and oh this actually works me being me oh this oh i can help other people and i want the listeners to really like understand what you just said with the vibe i'm definitely gonna make that a clip so people can can get that you gotta visualize identify build and invite like you you gotta have that's that's the word i don't know if y'all use that in england but it's a vibe you have to be a vibe yeah, and that's what you you have to do. Because if you don't have a vision for yourself, all those other things aren't going to work. If you don't have the thoughts in your mind that you can be great, coaching ain't going to work. Because you can get coaching all day, and if you don't think that you can do it, if you don't understand that you have it in you, and you don't put in the work, it's not going to work for you. So mm-hmm. I don't want people to think, oh, I got a coach, because I went through it, and I went to great coaching communities, and I didn't put in the work. And... I haven't got the results that I wanted uh, in a, in certain areas, but then I've got results in other areas because I put in that work. And you have to be, uh, my pastor said it today, you got to dominate in every area. And mm-hmm. it starts with the mind. And that's why your mm-hmm. mindset goes. It starts yes. with the mind. You, it does. You know, Everything starts with the mind. Yes. So we got, I think, I think this is a woman, we're going to go with three tips for women they don't got to just be black because everybody listens to the podcast. But for women, um, what are three tips that you can give someone? They might 
they might be going through a rough patch in their relationship. They might, you know, got got the job and it ain't going as they thought because they're a woman and sometimes women are treated different. They're just going through, you know, they're going through some stuff. What are three tips that can help them to change their mindset, change what they're doing, something that can, they can, you know, utilize after listening to this episode? Well, the first thing starts with the thoughts that you have. You have to be willing to challenge your thoughts because I'm going to be honest with you, just because you think it doesn't mean that, that it's true, right? And a lot of times we get so married to the narratives that we're telling ourselves that we don't actually realize that they're holding us back. So when we have these thoughts that I'm not good enough, you need to challenge them. Where does this thought come from? And do I have evidence to support it wholeheartedly? And if you don't, that's a narrative that you need to let go of. The, my number two would be get to know, like, and trust yourself. A lot of us are walking around victims of our circumstances, really not knowing who we are and what we want out of life and taking the time to get to know us, get to know what we want, commit to loving ourselves and trusting that we will make the right decisions, learning how to trust our intuition is very important. And the third and most important is to always remember that we are here to change the world. So our story is here to be transformational. Turn your mess into a message. Turn your test into a testimony and use your story as hope and inspiration for someone else. Mm, I love it. I love it. Ooh, we I love it. Challenge your thoughts, get to know and trust yourself, and understand that you're here to change the world by your story. And that's what the last one, you're so right. It took me to be in 30 years old to understand why I was born with short arms, with a disability, I had to go through all the different surgeries that I had to go through. And it was to inspire others, to tell people my story and how I overcame it. And it was like, so everything, and I had to realize everything I went through, all those times I got bullied, all those times that I didn't want to do something where I was treated different, it was for moments like this podcast, the moments when I go into the schools and, or just being an educator every day with my, with my kids and them seeing somebody that looks different, but is out here doing what they're supposed to do, you know, because they understand their purpose. So that's, that's a big one. You understand it don't matter what you're going through. It don't matter how ugly the story is, how bad the story is. Because guess what? The story can change. When you write a book, you can you can write another chapter. You can, mm -hmm. you know, that can be the old testimony. You got a new testimony coming up and you can write that. And that's what's going to help people of allowing them to understand uh, that you can change who you are and change your circumstance. That's why I allow you to tell your story because you your story is very powerful a lot of things fucked up happened in in your life just mm -hmm. in life and you didn't allow it to stop you and you didn't allow you know the old you the old relationships and now you're married you got kids you got a coaching um community you're got your own podcast you're doing the things that you want to do but it didn't start off like that and everybody mm -hmm. it's not going to start off for you like no but it's important to realize that nothing along our journey is lost. We may not see it right away, but everything serves a purpose. Every single thing. Hello? Hello? Oh, hello. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think I don't know what happened. But um, I, I was saying, can you um, give us an underdog quote, something that will help the people? I mean, you've been giving the gems all day, so I'm sure whatever you say is going to be very powerful. This is my favorite quote, so I'm going to share it with your listeners. Walk as if every step you take is about to create an avalanche because, boo, you are here to change the world. And like I said, if I had the little machine to drop the <laughs> mic, boom, right there. So how can, thank you again um, for adding value 
not just to women listeners, but to men listeners and myself. Thank you for sharing your story, which was very powerful. Um, and thank you for utilizing your afternoon time. I'm glad I got on your calendar so we could talk. <laughs> I'm glad I did it the professional way, you know, and got on the calendar. If I couldn't get on the calendar, we wouldn't have this conversation. <laughs> Yes, yes. I'm, I'm grateful to be on your platform. Thank you for letting me share my story. Oh, you're welcome. So allow the listeners, or tell the listeners, not allow, tell the listeners how they can reach you, how they can get in touch with you, you know, uh, social media, if they want to check out your coaching, your website. Uh, you got some nice blogs on there. I read one of them. So tell people how they can reach out to you. Sure. So my coaching um, social media is Black Rose Coaching. Black is spelled B-L-A-Q-U-E. Um, Rose Coaching on Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest. I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook for the business, um, but Choosing Her Hustle as well. ChoosingHerHustle.com. No, sorry. ChoosingHerHustlePodcast.com. Choosing Her Hustle podcast on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. All right. That is how you can reach um, Miss Black Rose. I'm going to call you Black Rose because you um, <laughs> the Black Rose. Is, uh, you definitely came and, and laid a Black Rose and killed a lot of um, negative thoughts, killed a lot of, you know, um, things that, have been stopping people from getting to the next level. So um, you can reach me, reach, yeah, it's just me and ain't no, I don't have a team. You can reach me at Underdog Talk Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, um, Underdog Talk Podcast at Gmail if you want to be on the show, if you want to reach out, if you got any good or bad comments, whatever, like, share, post review um underdog talk podcast on any platform do you have any closing words just love yourself that's the most important thing and on that note peace one love okay.